Hello and welcome to EDU 3530, the assessment course. Um, so today I'm just gonna go through the six questions that you guys have given me, give you my candid answers, and then talk to you about the test that I will be uploading today. Um, you guys will have a week to do it and you'll be able to um, upload that on Friday before 11.59 p.m. So here we go. From Alexa, IEPs are legal documents that seem like they are a process to obtain. What happens if a parent does not agree or approve of the IEP? Are parents allowed to decline it? Yes, ultimately parents are allowed to decline IEPs. Um, there are many times when a parent does not agree um, or approve of an IEP and then the team ultimately tries to bridge the parent's concerns with the needs of the child. Um, there have been times when um, a child has needed things and the parent hasn't been happy about it, but it is our responsibility as educators to provide them with enough evidence to convince them that this is in the best interest of their child and um, it's really the only way for them to truly succeed in education. Um, assessments are a large part of special education. Although they, they can have many different formats, how do we find more formal assessments for each kid? Are there certain criteria or required assessments for different learning disabilities? So um, as far as the ETR process, districts typically select um, specific formal assessments that uh, are per, like um, completed by the school psychologist. Um, there will be parts of that process that the school psychologist asks you to complete. There are also informal uh, um, parts of that assessment. So for formal parts, you're looking at like um, a BASC 3 or um, a Whistler intelligence test, um, things like that. Those are pretty formal. Um, again, this is going into Ed Psych and the district ultimately approves the assessments that they want to use to measure student ability, whether you're testing for cognitive delay or a specific learning disability, you're gonna to wanna to find an assessment that encompasses all of the suspected deficits. Now, being intervention specialist, this isn't really your realm. You guys wouldn't do much of that. So if you are looking at formal or required assessments for students, you're going to be looking at whatever standardized test your district has selected as far as third grade guarantee or their um, intelligence test that they do in the third grade or any other California achievement test or things like that. Um, those are the things that you're going to be administering, but as an intervention specialist, you really don't get to do a lot of the selecting. So most of the assessments that you'll be using are gonna be in-class assessments and um, just different uh, informal assessments along the lines of transition. Um, you'll do some forced choice menus to see what kind of things motivate your kids. Um, but there are infinite choices and really you just find the ones that you feel comfortable with and provide you the best information. From Emma, struggling learners, what are some fun ways that you can form an assessment that isn't always just giving them extra time or something on something or extra help? Like what other possible strategies could we possibly see in the classroom setting for a student with unique learning disabilities? Um, one thing that I have used with students and it does require extra time but it's not just giving them extra time. Um, students are allowed to dictate essays. I've done that before. I've had students who, instead of doing a paper assessment, have been able to do performance assessments. I've worked with teachers to allow students to create um, 
artwork or videos that meet all the criteria of the assessment and maybe follow a rubric. As far as essays go, there are times when you have students who will have an aversion to physical paper, a unique, um, a unique situation for me was a student who refused to write on paper. It was a texture thing. He couldn't handle the feeling of a graphite pencil on paper. So everything that he did was either in pen or dry erase. And we had to laminate all of the papers that he did or it would trigger him. Um, so things like that, we're now more fortunate that we can get everything um, in virtual format or electronic format and allow those students to really thrive and show what they know without um, allowing certain triggers or disabilities to really impact their performance on these assessments. So I would say that um, when you're looking at different situations to provide accommodations on an assessment, you really need to look at the kid and get to know your kid and see what kind of things trigger them and how they best perform. If you have a kid who is a selective mute, um, obviously you're not going to be able to get them to do phonics out loud. Um, we had a situation like that where I had a selective mute, did not talk in school for five years, and she did her phonics with her mom, who she spoke to, um, and her mom recorded it and sent it in. So the only time that we heard her voice in five years was via this recording. So there are lots of ways to check student understanding and still be academically rigorous. Next question. What's the difference between a 504 and an IEP? Is it significant or is one for students with mild to moderate behavior problems and the other is to help aid with the learning disability? Technically, they are both for both. To answer your question, a 504 is um, ensuring access. So a 504 is under Section 504 of the American Disabilities Act. You provide certain accommodations that provide access to education. Uh, they don't allow you to alter the curriculum and they don't allow you to um, provide anything in excess of what is um, reasonable. So for instance, a student with a physical, a, a temporary physical disability um, may need a 504 plan to uh, maybe switch their classes to a room that they can get to in their wheelchair. Um, if it was going to be a long-term situation, then you would want to push for an IEP to ensure access. Um, another situation, um, well, technically you can use the 504 for long-term access as long as uh, their disability is not impacting their academic performance and the only impact it would have is them not being able to get to a class. So that's a pretty good example. Another example would be a student who um, needed attendance accommodations for school or needed a temporary change of placement. We've done this with uh, childhood cancer a lot. Students who are going to be uh, receiving extended medical care and need to be out of school are provided with the opportunity to miss school without penalty. And then the teachers kind of come together and work on providing them with learning opportunities outside of the classroom. Uh, as far as an IEP, um, it truly is an individualized education plan. Hold on, Penelope. I got to answer this last question, okay? Okay, we'll go outside and play in a minute. But um, as far as... Yeah, I know. Uh, this is, Hello. <laughs> okay, let me answer these questions. Um, as far as an IEP goes, it is under um, IDEA 2004 that these are given access and they are truly individualized and they allow you to um, alter the curriculum or responsibilities of the student and um, quit baseball and really provide a student that may be um, behind academically with uh, educational objectives that will allow them to not only succeed, but to bridge the gap. <laughs>
Okay, next question is from Emmy. Is it common for parents to be unsupportive of their child receiving an IEP or an alternate learning plan? No, it's not really common because typically most of the requests come from parents and usually a teacher does not refer a kid until they've had multiple conversations with a parent. Um, as I said earlier, it, it can happen that parents don't agree with the IEP and they want parts changed, but typically you are there because the parent feels that their student needs more in order to be successful. Uh, final question, how do you determine a student's LRE? So LREs are determined um, by trial and error. Typically they start with the least restrictive, um, the general ed classroom, and then you let a student sit in there for a couple weeks and then reassess and then talk about whether you think that another environment would be more successful and then penalty. And then after that, you would um, get the team together and meet and amend the IEP and put them into a different environment. Uh, typically, you don't change a kid's environment from the general classroom until you have enough data to back it up. There have been situations where I've had kids that have been in a preschool um, multiple disabilities unit, gone to an elementary school multiple disabilities unit, and their behaviors have been so severe that we've had to switch them in the middle of the year to a kindergarten behavioral unit. Now that change was not made without weeks and weeks of data um, and actual numbers on how many times the student had been redirected and how many times they'd been removed from the educational setting. Um, so it takes that kind of it takes that kind of dedication to the data collection and to the process before you ultimately change a student's LRE. Again, an LRE is a team decision. It's not one that you would have to ever determine individually as an intervention teacher. Um, so that would be determined by you, your special ed coordinator, and your school psychologist, along with parents and principals. Um, the next thing that I would like to talk about, uh, the test for chapters one through three. This is the first test you guys are going to take, so I'm going to upload it. I would like you guys to look at the questions and then write short essays for each. Um, I would say that five paragraphs for each would be appropriate. Uh, so probably a page each on each question um, is is pretty good. Um, so let's go one page each for each question. Uh, so you guys should be turning in three pages of written work for this test. Please remember to check your grammar and cite anything from the book that you guys use. I hope that you have a great week. Um, some of you I will see tomorrow, and then um, for the rest of you, please get your questions in for the next video. Uh, I hope that you have a great week, and enjoy this Labor Day, and God bless. you have anything to say? Can you say bye?